in prisoner's chains with bleeding stripes Paul and Silas prayed that
His tone, facial expression, all of them sent a different message. And that message was this. I do have to say, you treat me like a god. Another burnt offering. <laughs> that evening is shot. Now the question is, why does this kind of thing happen? Come to the Love and Respect Marriage Conference, where you will learn what your spouse really means by what they say. seated. Thomas Olivers was an orphan boy, and he grew up today as, uh, as what we would call today a juvenile delinquent. And then, this was in the 1700s, Thomas Olivers heard George Whitfield preach. Whitfield was an evangelist in the 1700s, and he was very involved in the Great Awakening that was going on in both England and in America. When Olivers heard Whitfield's sermon, he realized for the first time that there was hope for him in Jesus Christ. And he was converted, and he later became an evangelist with John Wesley. One day he happened to be in a Jewish synagogue in London and heard Cantor Meyer Lyon sing a song based on the 13 articles of Jewish faith. He was so impressed that he went home and wrote the hymn, The God of Abraham Praise. 
the song that they're playing right now. It's a song of praise to the God of Abraham, and in tribute to the cantor, he named the tune Leone. Let's sing together the God of Abraham praise. <laughs> praise who reigns enthroned above ancient of everlasting days and God of love Jehovah great I am by earth and heaven confess I bow and bless the sacred name forever blessed. The God of Abram praise at whose supreme command on earth I rise and seek the joys at his right hand. I all on earth forsake its wisdom, fame, and power, and him my only portion make my shield and tower. He by himself hath sworn, I on his oath depend, I shall on eagle's wings upborne to heaven ascend. I shall behold his face, I shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. The whole triumphant host give thanks to God on high, Hail, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they ever cry. Hail, Abram's God and mine, I join the heavenly lays. All might and majesty ascribe the endless days. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Those who whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. Till oars alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, refuge dear, defensage dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. <laughs> this, sing it out from your heart. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of 
salvation, purchase of God, poured of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, ring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, all the day long sing it out this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long time now that we okay mic two okay whoa this is a time that we sign up for our ladies' tea. Um, we do it in between service so we can be fair to both first and second service. And as you know, we usually sign up in 30 minutes. We're full. So don't kill each other trying to get back there, but um, please come in and sign up. When you see the two Phyllis, both Phyllises are going to be at a table back there. Please, if you have a party of three or more, please go to that table. We'll direct you, because that's quite a few. But um, just sign up for our ladies' tea coming. Thank you. Thank you, baby. By the way, all of your meals have been scrumptious. <laughs> Except for that squash one a long time ago. And by the way, I'm delighted to see some of you uh, back today. You, you know, this, this church is always new because we have people coming in, we have people leaving, we have people visiting. And uh, for those of you back with us, it's good to see you. Welcome. We are studying in the book of Hebrews and talking about promises to keep. And I'd like you to follow along as I read from Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 11 through 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 through 20. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves. And with them an oath is given as a confirmation, is an end to every dispute. In the same way, God 
desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, that is, his promise and his oath, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope uh, set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, and then the camera's in the way, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is a portion that sort of comes between um, the author of Hebrews talking about Melchizedek. It's, a, it's almost a, a wonder why he put this in, but he wants these Hebrew readers to realize that Abraham was given promises and God is going to fulfill those promises but the promise was Messiah. The promise was Jesus. And, and these people had, had trusted Jesus, but they were tempted to go back to Judaism. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to ask the question that really has an obvious answer. Can you really trust God to keep his promises? You know, we always say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure until something happens in our lives and then it seems it seems like maybe he didn't keep his promises we have such a uh, an expert on people saying things our former president says that nearly everyone will lie to you given the right circumstances but god won't you know the president's not too far off there let me be honest, having worked with people for many, many, many years, yeah, people do tend to lie. Pastors know that. Doctors know that. Dentists know that. Did you brought no, no, sir, you know. Um, but God doesn't lie. And with that, uh, I think these folks in this place, we don't even know where that the letter to the Hebrews was given, these folks are beginning to feel like, God hasn't kept his promises to us. We're going through persecution. We trusted Jesus. And maybe all this thing about the Christian life is, is a lie. And maybe he's not going to perform his promises to us like we thought he would. So let's go back and, and remind ourselves of what's going on with these Hebrews. The letter is called To the Hebrews. We don't know which Hebrews they were, but obviously it was a group of Jewish people who had become Christians. They were Jews. They had trusted Christ as their Messiah, and they were being persecuted. And so they're tempted to go back to the temple, go back to Judaism, go back to all of these things that they had been raised in because it's a little hot being a Christian, the other Jews were hurting them. And the author of Hebrews wants them to know that the Jewish system was just a shadow of the things to come. They were going back to the shadows when the reality, the fulfillment of the pictures, uh, Messiah Jesus had come. They had trusted the fulfillment of God's promise. But because now they were Christians, they were being persecuted, but they needed to have the same kind of faith that Abraham had because the God of Abraham was going to follow through on his promises as he always did. Now, there's something else about this section that allows me to spend just a moment uh, talking about a question of Jews and Christians and how we Christians today are supposed to respond to Jews. And whether you know it or not, there is a big debate in denominations about how to treat the Jews. And it's been true ever since the cross. Uh, for instance, is God finished with the Jews as a nation? 
Don't answer my question for me. This is my sermon. Who said that? <laughs> you have been taught well. Has the church become the new Israel? How should Christians look at Judaism since they rejected and crucified Jesus? Now, with all of that in mind, I, we're going to play a little game. Okay, you ready? Here it is. I can see they didn't turn on my music. There's the music. Okay, and this game is known as Who Said That? Here's the object of the game, folks. I'm going to read you a statement, and you are going to tell me who said that. Are you ready? Here we go. Here's the statement. Who said? What shall we Christians do with this? Bad word deleted. Rejected race of Jews. First, their synagogues should be set on fire. And whatever does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one may be able to see a cinder or stone of it. And this ought to be done for the honor of God and the glory of Christianity in order that God may see we are Christians. Secondly, their homes likewise should be broken down and destroyed. Who said that? It was, you are right, it was Martin Luther, the man who started the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. Who would have known that, you know? This great man hated Jews? Yes, just like the Christians before him and after him, believe it or not. Uh, most Christians are, are shocked when they realize that the church was one of the initiators of anti-Semitism that led to Hitler being able to persecute the Jews. The church was in on it, unfortunately. And unfortunately, many people today would be shocked to learn that there are churches today teaching a doctrine that is giving us that same sort of anti-Semitism. And maybe you've seen it on the news. It's beginning to rise again. And it's coming out of church doctrine. Not, all, not only church doctrine. But you see, that's the problem with teaching that the Jews have been put aside and are no longer in God's plan. There's a new book out, and I recommend it for you. It is by Joel Richardson. It's called When a Jew Rules the World. And as I was reading it, I thought, man, you have done an amazing historical research. And he shows all of the church fathers who hated the Jews and all of the people after that who, who pushed anti-Semitism. And, and one of his purposes in the book is to do that. He shows, first of all, that the Christian church doctrine made it possible for Hitler to rise to power and destroy the Jews. I know we don't like to hear it, but, but it's true. He quotes in his book, one of the church historians and theologians, Hans Kuhn, who said, Nazi anti-Judaism was the work of godless anti-Christian criminals, but it would not have been possible without the almost 2,000 years prehistory of Christian anti-Judaism. It's that same sort of anti-Judaism that is uh, being taught today in a lot of churches. It's called, and I'm going to use my word, I call it replacement theology. But every time I talk with someone who believes, in my opinion, replacement theology, they changed the terms on me, so I don't exactly know what to call it anymore. But replacement theology says this. Let me show you some pictures. Easier for me to see through pictures. Replacement theology starts out with the Jews, and it says God chose the Jews. He chose the Jews, and he promised them a kingdom. But along the way, when God sent the Messiah, the Jews rejected their Messiah. And they put him on a cross. They said, we will not let this man rule over us. So they rejected God's plan. And so God rejected them. And now he is giving the promises of the Jews to 
the real Israel, which is the church. And there are lots and lots of churches that teach that. Uh, you say, well, who? Well, first of all, as I say, it's impossible to pin some of them down because they changed their wording. But here's the issue. The issue is, will God fulfill his promise to give an earthly kingdom to the Jews? Will he do that? There are a great many who say no. Those who uh, <clears throat> tend to fit into that group are uh, Roman Catholics. They believe that uh, the Jews' day has passed. Uh, Episcopalians, uh, Methodists, Lutherans. Uh, most Christian churches, now the Christian church has had some changes over the last few years. It's hard to keep up with who believes what. But uh, most Presbyterians, I, I was surprised that D. James Kennedy believed in replacement theology as we were talking about before. That's most of them. We are among the few who say, no, God still has a plan for Israel and we need to be very careful with our teaching about the word of God and our understanding of it. And we dare not miss the warning of the apostle Paul. Let me take you to it in Romans chapter 11. Uh, there is one noted theologian who says, I would believe in replacement theology if it were not for what Paul says in Romans 11. And Paul makes it clear here. Romans 11 Verse 1, he says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Uh, that's a, a question in Greek that demands you to say, no, he hasn't. May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. I say then, this is verse 11, we've skipped down here. They, the Jews, did not stumble so as to fall did they may it never be but by their transgression salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous but if some of the branches were broken off that's the Jews and you Gentiles being uh, a wild olive were grafted in among them and became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. In other words, God didn't choose the Gentiles. He chose the Jews. You will say that, well, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. The reason I bring this up is because the author of Hebrews is using this point with the Hebrew Christians to let them know how God has worked with Abraham's people. For I do not want you to uh, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as, as, it, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now that's going to help us when we come to chapter 8 and deal with the new covenant in Hebrews. Now, in the next verse, the Apostle Paul gives us two responses to Jewish people because indeed the Jews rejected their Messiah. And he says you have two basic responses from them uh, to them. Verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. And they certainly were to Paul. They tried to keep him from preaching the gospel all over the world. They hounded him. They beat him. They turned him in constantly. So he says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. 
But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So here's the point. Unbelieving Jews have always been a problem for the gospel, but that's their problem. That's how they respond to us. Paul's point is we are not supposed to respond to them that way. We are supposed to share the gospel in love with all men in spite of how they respond to it. Uh, secondly, we must remember that the promise or, or that in the promise God made to the Jews, he also made a promise to us and gave us a warning. Here's a, a I'm not sure I follow. What promise are you talking about? And what warning? Well, let's burn rubber and go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Because through the Jewish nation came the Messiah, came the Savior, came the Redeemer of the world. So don't forget the promise and its warning. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. Uh, we've talked about it before, but just think through history with me, folks. History bears it out. The Egyptians, even though the Jews were doing the wrong thing, the Egyptians cursed them and they were cursed. Following the Egyptians were the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, Oh, you can put in the Persians too, Greece, Rome, and then of course Germany with Hitler. And then the questionable United States. How will our present response to Jewish people be received? Will God bless us or will he curse us? With all of that in mind, we need to understand that God had a plan that included Jews to reach all of the world for his sake. And with that in mind, the author of Hebrews gives this, what I think is a key verse about God kept his promise to Abraham. So he repeats to his Jewish Christian readers, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. His point is, God blessed the Jews through Abraham. He sent the Messiah. You've trusted the Messiah. Now, you need to have the same kind of faith that Abraham had in spite of all of the slavery, in spite of all the difficulties, in spite of the centuries that passed over him, you need to look back at the fact that God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. He will fulfill it to you too, Jewish Christians. So the author of Hebrews says here there are two basic reasons to trust God. I don't know if you picked them up as we read it, but the first one is he promised he promised. He, he made a promise. And God cannot lie. And then the author of Hebrews says he not only promised, but he swore. Now, my version says he made an oath. The word is God swore. We tend to think of swearing as cursing. But do you understand what swearing really is? Uh, look at verses uh, 13 and following here. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise, for men swear by one greater than themselves, 
and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. Here's what swearing really means. Here you are. You, you make a promise to somebody. That's the promise. But when you swear, swearing really means you're calling upon somebody else, and usually it means somebody bigger, tougher, stronger, wiser than you are. You call upon them to hold you accountable for what you promised. And that's what real swearing is. Um, many people take God's name in it and so forth. And Jesus said, don't swear at all. You can't swear on the temple. That's all about God. You can't swear upon the hair on your head because you're lo Well, he said, because they're given by God. And he, he said, so he said, don't swear at all. But the idea of swearing is you back up the promise by calling a stronger person to hold you accountable. God couldn't do that. There was nobody bigger than he was. Nobody stronger than he was. And so the author of Hebrews says, since God could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. He's a God who cannot lie. When he says it, he's going to back it up. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, that is the Jews, the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us he's saying to these jewish christians have faith have the same faith that god as he promised abraham and fulfilled his promise he's going to fulfill his promise to you as jewish christians now as a pastor coming at this passage you know it, it really comes to this point and it's such a simple point that everybody would agree with it's kind of hard to make it sound really important but when God makes an unconditional promise you can absolutely trust him to do it but remember folks not all of the promises that God made were unconditional see if God makes a condition to it unless you fulfill the condition then he's not going to fulfill his part but when he makes an unconditional promise, as he did to Abraham, I will bless you. I will bring it to pass. When God makes those kind of promises to us, you can count on it. He always will bring it to pass. I mean, you think of situations in our life like this. There's no way I can provide for my family. What would you say to a Christian like this? Yes, you can, because God made a promise. God said in Matthew chapter 6, do not worry then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. God promised he will do it. Of course, we always try to put in extra little things. God, I want you to do it by Tuesday, and I want you to do it by... Do no, 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 that's not the way God's promises work. But he promised, and he will do it. Or I think of somebody, nobody loves me. Yes, somebody loves you. God promised it. Jesus promised it. Just as the Father has loved me, he said, I have also loved you. Somebody does love me. Or I look at our Heavenly Father who has over 4,000 years worth of trustworthiness. I mean, you know, an insurance company is judged by how well it's done over the years. The eternal insurance company of the Father is highly rated. You cannot possibly not be provided for when God makes the promise. He always comes through. And that's why I say you can trust him. I could not nearly, nearly 
say it as well as one of my favorite preachers. I read a favorite sermon of his, oh, probably a year ago called, uh, uh, That's My King. This is another one of his sermons. By the way, his name was Pastor S.M. Lockridge. Wish I could preach like him. I can't, but I can read like him. He is the one who has made us. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. I'm telling you, church, you can trust him. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He is enduringly strong and entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast and immortally graceful. He is imperially powerful and he is impartially merciful. He is the greatest phenomena that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is the sinner's savior. He is the centerpiece of civilization. I'm trying to tell you today, church, you can trust him. He does not have to call for help and you cannot confuse him. He doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He's august and he's unique. He's unparalleled and unprecedented. He's supreme and he's preeminent. He is the loftiest ideal of literature, the highest personality in philosophy. He is the fundamental doctrine of all theology. He is the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion, the miracle of the age. He is the superlative of everything good that you can call him. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He can satisfy all your needs, and he can do it instantaneously. He supplies strength for the weak, and he's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he sees. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleansed the leper. He forgave sinners and he discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He is the leader of legislators. He is the overseer of the overcomers and the governor of the governors. He is the key to knowledge, the wellspring of wisdom, the doorway of deliverance, the pathway of peace, the roadway of righteousness. He is the highway of holiness. He is the gateway of glory. He is the master of the mighty. He is the captor of the conquerors and the head of the heroes. He is the leader of the legislators the overseer, the prince of princes, and the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. You can trust him. His promise is sure. His matchless life is matchless again still. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. And all God's people said, you can trust him. Say it with me. You can trust him. Father, thank you for that fact. And I pray today that if there's anyone here struggling with their lives, if it's the fact that they don't know for certain if they'll spend eternity in heaven with you, I pray that they would trust you for that. They would accept your free gift of salvation. But Lord, I realize that many of us have already done that. And yet as believers, sometimes we wonder about the promises you make when We don't see you acting the way we think you ought to act or working in what we think you ought to work in. And we get discouraged, disheartened. And then, Lord, we're reminded again of who you are. You can't even swear on anybody else because you are the greatest of the great. Thank you for your promises. Help us by faith to trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.